Okay, I think we can we can get started now. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, today, uh, so I'm Shiva Garwal, founder and CEO of Earth ID, which is a decentralized identity management platform. Uh, I'm also leading government blockchain association in UK and Europe. So this is, today is our fourth event in the, the decentralized identity series, wherein uh, wherein we discuss about how decentralized identity can help different industry sectors. So today the focus is on payments. So we will be discussing about how decentralized identity can help uh, improve how the payments are made, how can we make them more secure and seamless. So the, today's agenda is basically we will have one presentation from Devjani Mohanty, who's a SSI expert, and she'll be talking about different innovative use cases. And then we'll have a panel discussion where we have uh, multiple uh, industry thought leaders who would talk about, who would share their uh, knowledge and expertise with respect to uh, what, what is happening in the industry and then how, how how we are innovating different use cases. So thank you very much for joining in. Uh, let, let's get started. Uh, Devjani has kindly recorded her uh, uh, presentation so that we don't have any technical glitches. So I would just play that uh, now and uh, then basically we'll get going. Just give me one second so that I can quickly play that. And Devjani would be available in the in the chat discussion. So please feel to uh, ask any questions that 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 you have. Okay. So share screen. So I'll share my entire desktop. Uh, can can someone confirm that if my screen is uh, visible? Yes, I can yeah, see that. Good. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, so ready to go. I'm just clicking the play button and then we are good. Good to morning. Go. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all of you to this session on decentralized identity for payment sector. Today, we would cover the issues in traditional payments, some novel use cases using self-sovereign identity, biometrics, and a couple of other emerging technologies. And finally, we would explore the state of art architecture of Earth ID. Before moving ahead, let me give you a quick introduction regarding myself. I'm Devjani Mohanty. I work as a SSI expert at Earth ID. I'm a blockchain solution architect, and I have authored five books on blockchain that you can find on Imagine, and my latest work is on SSI. Let's first cover the issues in traditional payment system. Identity theft continues to affect people across the globe with credit card fraud topping the list in the year 2019 and 20. Overall, more than 9 million Americans have their identity stolen each year and that's on a steady rise. Hackers get access to victims' credit card details and sell many such numbers wholesale in the dark web. Payment card fraud losses are organized into five different categories. We can see that remote purchase, which means shopping on a website or shopping over the internet, occupies the first position and this has increased in the last couple of years. Have you ever thought who pays for the compensation? Well, victims of unauthorized payment card fraud are legally protected against losses. Industry analysis indicates that bank and card companies refund customers in over 98% of cases. Yet, ultimately, it hits the customer's pocket as insurance protection and higher fees. Let's see how such information are stolen. They can be broadly divided into five different categories. The first one, hacker may get access to a company's centralized database where credit card information is stored for processing payment. This can affect millions of consumers. Example is Equifax data breach of 2017. Second is skimming, a credit card skimmer, uh, which is a very small device that captures your credit card information from a legitimate transactions. So hackers secretly place the credit card skimmer over the credit card swipe machine at a gas station 
or ATMs and retrieve the required information. Third one is, um, you know, uh, malware or viruses. So the hacker trick the user to install a malware software on uh, machines and monitor the user's keystroke or send the screenshots to the hacker. The fourth one, uh, fourth one is pretty popular, phishing, where the hacker tricks the consumer into giving up credit card information by phone, email, or through fake websites. And final is dumpster diving, where the hacker get access to the credit card information from our receipts that we forget to shred. So what is common among all these cases is that hackers are looking for customers' personal information all the while, uh, which is their digital identity, which they use to commit fraud. So let's now explore what is digital identity. Digital identity is any personal data that identifies you online. We use digital identity during registration, any kind of identity management, login, authorization and access to online data, and deregistration. Basically, this is needed for initiating any kind of business relationship online. Why to protect digital personal data? Well, out of all the data breaches, personal data theft occupies the first position. Here, you can see the top data breaches of all times. It includes the, some of the biggest names as eBay, Adobe, and Them. And it has affected hundreds of millions of people. And the data that got stolen were crucial as bank details, credit card details, passwords, etc. The top reason for such theft are centralized server and weak passwords. Let's see how data related to digital identity are stored. The first model that came almost three decades back was centralized server where we used either LDAP or Active Directory or RDBMS to store separate set of user ID and password for each application. The second model is federated identity model where we use a separate identity provider that has a centralized storage within it uh, with all the credential of users and it handles the access to several third parties. But both models are vulnerable to mass hacking and single point of failure. Self-sovereign identity is a new decentralized model to manage digital identity. Here, we have an issuer that issues verified credentials to the user that is saved securely in user's mobile device. At the same time, issuer sends a signed reference hash to the public blockchain. User can share the whole or part of the data to a verifier along with the issuer's public decentralized identity. Now the verifier can check the hash of the data on blockchain to know that if it is valid. The example can be a scenario where issuer is a passport office and verifier is the visa office and the user sharing as much data needed by the visa office with full consent. At a later point of time, if needed, the issuer can revoke the hash by altering a small piece of data and the verifier will be able to know that the data is no longer valid. This architecture ensures integrity, ownership, privacy, security, and validity of the data. And please note that there is no centralized storage over here. In real life, there are multiple issuers or certifying bodies or organizations who issue different sets of verified credentials. For example, Alice is born in a hospital that issues the first set of credentials. Then she applies for a national identity number, such as Aadhaar in India, which is issued by the government. Then she joins a school or a college that issues the third verified credential. 
then she joins an organization um, as an employee that issues another set of verified credentials. The user saves this information to his mobile device most securely, and the user can then share whole or part of uh, this data or in combination from different issuers uh, with a third party as and when needed. The user can share this data in three different modes. That is traditional mode, like I'm sharing my name as it is, zero knowledge proof mode where I'm not um, sharing the exact information, but sharing only in Boolean, like yes or no or true or false. Like if somebody asked me whether I'm um, older than 25, then I would say yes. So, and that would solve their purpose. Um, and at the same time, I'm not sharing my private data. So that is zero knowledge proof and selective sharing. Um, and then finally, the user can share some data in self-attested mode where um, the user doesn't need any kind of certificate. Like I'm just um, I'm just quoting that my hobbies are such and such. So nobody need to certify that. So those information can be shared on a self-attested mode. And also this sharing happens between the issuers also. Like the first issuer would do a background verification and um, issue the first set of certificate, but all the next issuers would be first the verifiers. They would first check the previous data and then they would issue their certificate. So it works in a chain. Um, and then um, in this architecture, we also have a publicly available blockchain where the issuers would send their reference hashes and the verifiers can read and check uh, whether the data is valid. The SSI ecosystem is usually pretty complex where we have to handle the web standards, the authentication standards, the open source blockchain part, as well as the decentralized identity networks. So mostly um, the SSI network comes in four different layers. We have a public ledger or a DLT to look after. We have private, private identity storage. Um, and then we got a layer of agent or hub for uh, message transfers and then um, uh, client devices for each of the user. The work involved, the architecture of self-sovereign identity is not limited to only data sharing. How would you get access to such a system? Where would we save different type of personal data? Well, for an individual, it's the mobile device or an IPFS device on cloud storage. So here you can see Alice is keeping all her data in her mobile device um, in its natural form or with encryption. Whereas Bob is keeping uh, the, his data on his mobile device and a separate copy on IPFS. For the organization, it's all the data can be encrypted and stored on a um, uh, cloud storage. And then we also have to handle the public ledger, uh, which is responsible for uh, deed creation, reference hash of claims and revocation registry. Let's explore some use cases. The first one is Earth IDs, next chain authentication and authorization architecture. At Earth ID, we are using the combination of biometrics and SSI for authenticating users online. Hence, before moving ahead, let's figure out how biometrics works. First, we use a scanner to scan the user's biometric profile, such as the finger, face, iris, retina, or palm band, and then we extract some unique feature out of it. We map them and save them to a biometric database in form of biometric template. So biometric template looks something like this. It's in binary form, 0101, 01, like that. So this part is similar to the registration process we, where we create a unique user ID and password. At a later date, user can log in using the same biometrics and system matches it against the biometric template saved within it. 
and we used um, machine learning to recognize that you know and compare those two templates spoofing is pretty common in biometric matching spoofing is a method of pooling a biometric identity system where an artificial object like a fingerprint mold made of uh, silicon is present to the scanner which leads the hacker to get access to authorized data uh, and services originally meant for the rightful owner so how can we avoid spoofing by using anti spoofing mechanism that gives the user a challenge like if you are using your face as your biometrics then the scanner would ask you to smile or turn your head if you are using iris it could ask you to blink your eyes if you are using fingerprint the sensor would check the temperature and pressure of the impression and of course there is machine learning algorithm to study the high quality images at rtd we are blending biometrics and ssi for next gen authentication system the users biometrics would be captured only on the uh, mobile device and it is stored here during registration which happens only once the biometric template can be sent to the issuer here if needed perhaps for a national identity program there would be a round of background verification for the user de duplication and template can be saved uh, for identity creation and matching in future Uh, to make sure that multiple fake identities cannot be created by a single person for most of the use cases this step would not be needed finally the issuer would send a hash to the public blockchain signing it with their own private key later the issuer can log in to the same organization or a different organization that trusts the first organization again from the same mobile device where the te template matching would happen um and uh, the verifier would just check that the hash uh, that is passed to it is matching with the person on the blockchain issued by the issuer for this use case uh, we are using face iris fingerprint as the biometric at the moment in future we have the plan to use behavioral biometrics as voice and gait Now let's explore Arthur's novel and very interesting use case of privacy preserving payments which means that you are paying using your credit card or debit card and yet not revealing any personal data with the merchant but is that possible let's see i believe that all of you are aware how a uh, traditional payment system works here when you purchase anything online or offline you have to share your credit card details on merchant's web server from where it goes to a payment gateway and then to the bank from where the amount goes to the mer merchant's account now let's explore arthrides privacy preserving payment architecture in this use case let's say that the user has an account with this well known bank now the user is visiting a restaurant in person or visiting a website on internet where he is ordering for some delicious ice creams now the restaurant or the website asks for payment with the amount to pay the merchant's account details and a unique reference number the user sends an instruction to the bank with all these details for payment the bank does the payment and sends a confirmation and at the same time sends a reference hash to the public blockchain signing it with its own private key the user shares those details to the merchant the merchant checks the reference on the blockchain and delivers the ice cream here you are able to generate the trust for the payment confirmation and at the same time not revealing the credit card details of the user with any third party the next use case is on demand location tracking for fraud detection 
I believe we all are aware how location tracking works either for an individual or a vehicle through a mobile device. Now, let's go to the details of this use case. Location tracking is pretty useful to combat fraud in the world of payment. However, it raises high concern among many people over privacy and misuse. In this slide, you can find some of the extracts from a very recent report by payments.com where they have mentioned the reasons why people are not willing to share their location information, especially the elderly are the most reluctant ones due to privacy and safety concern. There are also the group of people who are most targeted for credit card frauds. Now let's explore our ideas on demand location tracking with SSI use case. In this use case, you can find that the user is doing some payment and only at that time the user is requesting its network service provider for verified location details. Now the network service provider would keep on sending hashes of location details of the user uh, from time to time to the public blockchain and only after receiving a request. And then it returns the location credentials to the user. The user then can share the location data with the payment provider uh, during the payment. The payment provider can check the hash uh, and know that whether it's matching with the user's provided details. Doing so, the payment can be completely fraud proof. The final use case is of biometric cards for payment. I believe most of you might have heard of biometric cards. Many banks started dispatching such cards to their customers. Now let's explore how such a biometric card works for payment. Biometric cards are extremely secure. You have to visit your bank and prove your identity. They would issue you a blank card with a sensor and all mechanism to capture biometrics with liveness detection test. So how that is done? Because each card has got an inbuilt sensor that can even check the temperature and pressure of a fingerprint. So with this mechanism, your biometric template would not be sent over the internet or stored on the server, but it would be there only set on the card and it would be matched on the card itself while you do the payment either in a shop or uh, you know you visit an ATM for cash withdrawals. Hence there is no possibility of man in the middle attack with this approach. So this is a very uh, new use case and uh, there are banks who have started dispatching biometric cards to their users. Biometric cards are a very novel product in the market and many of us are not sure what kind of issues and frauds it might bring in. Hence, we are trying to introduce on-demand location tracking with SSI to give this card additional security. We are still exploring this use case and there can be additional possibilities in future. Okay, so we went through quite a few of our novel use cases. Now let's explore Arthardy's area of research. At Arthardy, the factors that we consider for SSI success and global adoption are as below. First of all, the SSI network should be integrated with biometrics and that should be a very strong area. Um, scalability and throughput should be high uh, because it's uh, in SSI, we are dealing with users who are people like you and me and uh, devices in future, like each person can be having uh, more than one device. So that is why we are talking about the scalability of not 100 or 1000, but maybe millions or even more. Um, 
cyber security should be good enough interoperability should be good enough um, your identity network should be um, mutually integratable with other decentralized identity network uh, the selective disclosure and zero knowledge proof should be uh, uh, should be uh, uh, you know distinguishing feature you know how good you have uh, made it uh, work uh, so that would uh, make sure that you are able to share your data in different modes. Uh, and then who are your validators? Like uh, um, in most of the networks, people ask me that who are your validator nodes? That means who are the organization who are involved in the public blockchain to um, you know, allow the transactions or maintain the transactions. So these are some of the SSI success factors. Here is the system architecture of ID. We are aligning with market leaders and best of the breed biometrics providers and trying with different type of biometrics, which are most accurate and can be used with existing smartphones without the need of additional equipment such as sensors. We are using Hashgraph as our public blockchain, which is known for its high cybersecurity features and also high scalability and throughput. It has been tested with 10,000 transactions per second and 1.5 million transactions per day and still counting. This is exactly what is needed for a decentralized identity platform that would need to cater to millions, if not billions of users in future and also their devices for uh, uh, data communication and data sharing. Also, Hashgraph's validated nodes are run by industry leaders from each business vertical, such as Google, IBM, Dodge Telecom, Tata Telecom, FIS, Wipro, etc., who already have a lot of trust in the market. So I hope you liked the session. For any queries, you can always approach ArthID or send me a note on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful keynote. We really appreciate it. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it very much. My name is Ingrid Basilio Feltas. I'm the Chief Ethics Officer for uh, GBA. And it's my great honor today to moderate our panel. As you can notice we have a distinguished uh, panel with us. We have four guests and I'm gonna introduce them one by one briefly. Uh, please forgive me, I'm gonna just trim your bios because otherwise we would take up the whole event. <laughs> so I'm just gonna highlight a few elements from each of you. Uh, first, we have um, John Carpenter. He's the co-founder of the Global Blockchain Summit and the Global Data Summit. He's also a sought after blockchain speaker, author, educator, and consultant. He's the chief operating officer of Pinnacle Card, a leading e-commerce company, as well as Proof a Touchless Payments. Next, we also have Dr. Sindhu Bashkar. He is the chairman and CEO of EST Global Inc., an enterprise based in the Boston Cambridge MIT ecosystem. He has three decades of niche experience and is a firm believer of innovation-driven entrepreneurship and is working tirelessly towards borderless banking. Next, we also have with us Ritesh, Jain, and Ritesh is the co-founder of Infinite and the former CEO of HSBC. He led the future of payments for Visa and introduced Apple Pay to us. Presently, he's a member of the G20 Initiative for Financial Inclusion, advisor to open banking in the EU and Africa. He's also part of the HBR payment regulators and government bodies, as well as a member of MIT Global Tech Panel. He has been a mentor to the UK Parliament Digital Service and Startup. Last but not least, we have Prashant Sharma, who is vice president currently for digital identity product at MasterCard. And he's primarily responsible for setting product vision, strategy, and the product roadmap. He has been with MasterCard for over 12 years in different areas, including digital identity, acceptance, digital payments, and technology. Prior to MasterCard, Prashant worked as a technology consultant in telecom and in the airline domain. I think Prashant has a few slides to share with us. So we're looking forward to kick off our panel with those slides, and then we're gonna start our uh, interactive discussion. The floor is yours. Great. Um, 
And great, thank you so much. And you can hear me okay, right? Perfect, yes. And we great. Let me just share my screen. And great, do you have to make me a presenter to be able to host or I'm just not seeing an option to you should be able to do it now. Okay, I see it. Yep, I see it now. All right. Guys, can you see my screen? Perfect. <clears throat> Okay, great. Um, so as Ingrid mentioned, uh, my name is Prashant Sharma. Um, I'm the VP of uh, product of digital identity at MasterCard. Um, I've been in those roles for the last couple of years, but uh, have been in various roles within MasterCard, including digital payments, acceptance. So have a lot of experience uh, uh, in terms of digital identity and payment. So just want to take a few minutes just to talk about the work that, that we are doing in this particular area. And this is a very, very passionate area for, for me. Uh, digital identity is a critical area that MasterCard is focusing on, putting a lot of investment. Payment, as everybody knows, is our bread and butter. So let's just talk about uh, uh, digital interactions. You know, before we get into digital identity and payments, um, a lot of us, we have been impacted because of what happened with COVID. Um, we think we're moving online. A lot of things that we were doing, whether it's uh, opening up a bank account, uh, whether it's education, applying for health insurance, a lot of those things we were doing online before COVID hit. But after COVID, given that we were not able to do any face-to-face -face interactions, all these transactions, they, they were amplified and new transactions are coming up as well. And our goal is we want to make sure that any digital interaction, just similar to the work that we do in payment, are made more secure and convenient so that it becomes a very, very seamless experience to the consumers. Um, when it comes to digital identity and payment, you know, digital identity, if you think about everything that MasterCard does uh, in, in payments world, whether it's a chip on the card or a pin that the user enters during a transaction, uh, the work that we are doing in tokenization, 3D secure. The whole idea is that we have to make the whole payment ecosystem very secure because if there's no security, if there's no trust in the ecosystem, a payment ecosystem cannot uh, uh, stay without that. So when we started thinking about how do we drive digital identity in the mainstream? Yes, you have to handle the high, high friction use cases, you know, applying for mortgage, applying for loan, making sure that your data is secure, the data is not shared without your permission. We also have to focus on some of the, uh, you know, the high risk use cases or the high frequency use cases. And payment is, is one of the use cases that we have to focus on. Um, and, you know, adding convenience and security to these transactions, giving more control to the user in their shopping experience can, can drive the adoption of digital identity and make payment ecosystem much more secure. Um, and if you think about payment right now, the user only makes a payment at the very end of the transaction. Um, you can log in anonymously, you can just create a user account, and you can just, just try to check out. A merchant generally has no idea who is interacting with their system unless and until you have created an account. Now imagine if you are checking in using your digital identity, so you are saying this is me, and the merchant knows who you are, they can provide you a lot of value added services. It can be uh, targeted uh, content, targeted offers, uh, other value added services. So if digital identity is the way for a user to check in, it just makes that experience much more seamless, much more secure, um, and much more safer. And it increases your touch point from checkout to check-in. So you check in, you browse for the items, and the, at the very end, you can make the payment. So digital identity and payment is very critical for us, but it's not just around card payments. Um, anybody who, who knows about MasterCard, yes, we started mostly as uh, a company that was focused on card-based transaction. But in last few years, our strategy has changed, and we can provide transactions, uh, payment transactions across all the rates. So whether it's ACH using billing uh, or, or bill payment or person to person payment or uh, disbursements, we play a critical role in all those areas. And everything requires identity verification as well. So I just want to make sure that people understand that digital identity and payment, it's not just associated with consumer initiated merchant payment, this spans across the entire payment ecosystem. And we want to make sure that if we can bring digital identity and payment uh, pay payments together, we should be able to make the, the, all these interactions uh, much more simple and much more seamless. 
Um, here are just a couple of use cases. You know, when we talk about digital identity, we talk about user being able to prove who they are with a high level of assurance. And generally those attributes, uh, and again, these attributes can be, can be a lot others as well, but some of the common attributes are my, my name, my address, my date of birth. Uh, this can include my verified documents, so my passport or uh, driver's license. This can be age verification, employment verification. But then if you think about the use cases, um, I'm buying a bottle of wine online. I have to prove that I'm above age of 21, but then I have to make a payment. If I'm uh, applying for um, an Airbnb account, I have to, to prove who I am, but then I have to make payment. So we just feel that digital identity by itself, yes, it solves for a lot of use cases, but if you can make uh, payments associated with that, it can just, just unlock many other use cases as well. So I have some examples over here. So these can be making travel booking, making uh, a sensitive product, um, buying online, picking up in the store. So anything that requires you to prove who you are and you have to make a payment, digital identity and payment together can unlock many other use cases. And then just very quickly, the last slide, this just shows you know, a sample experience. Again, we, we are working on various use cases this is just showing how making an airline booking, uh, providing your identity data as well as payment data can just make this process very seamless. So a user uh, wants to make a booking, click on the button, authenticate themselves, provide the consent. And again, uh, consent is super critical. Transparent is very important. Transparency is very important to us. So a user is seeing exactly the data that the merchant is requesting. So they see the data, their name, their passport details, their email address, and the payment details. So all your data um, uh, can be given to the merchant with your consent. The merchant requests or uh, receives your passport details and your payment details, and you can just complete the purchase. So a very simple and streamlined experience uh, just for one use cases, but time digital identity and payment can unlock various other experiences as well. And good, happy to take any questions. If not, back to you. Great, thank you. I don't think we have any questions yet for this specific thing, but I, I think this is a great segue to one of the questions I had prepared for the panel. Uh, I would love to hear your opinions on what type of strategic considerations do you think other payment providers as well in the ecosystem need to, to uh, have to, to overcome some of the barriers we see in adoption or what uh, strategies you think they can have to increase uh, adoption and, and you think are drivers of success? Maybe we can start with Ritesh. Hi, Ingrid. So I've been involved in the payments as, as you mentioned around, uh, I was leading the future of payments for Visa. So when I introduced Apple Pay, and that was a milestone change in the industry in terms of the contactless payments. And it has changed the face of the payments. Specifically when we look into the uh, globally, there was a significant transformation payments in last decade. The best use case is UPI, Unified Payments Interface from India. But still, like when we think about the payment, one thing comes into the mind is about the trust and the security, and that lies into your identification. So obviously, we definitely need the self sovereign identity, SSI, and there are multiple factors to it. Adoption by the different providers, that is not going to be a challenge. We need a robust system. I can tell you a simple example this morning, I have lost money because I couldn't identify myself in a bank. I was trading on a platform. I had to transfer money so that my trade could execute. And it was a successful trade. But in the meantime, I couldn't transfer money because I forgot my password. And that is a genuine, I'm not making it up, but that happened actually this morning. So think about, and that's a regular <clears throat> challenges. We as an individual, we hold our own identity, but we don't own our identity in the internet space. So our identity is owned by the multiple players. What we want, we want a basic right where we own our identity and we don't have to go through these challenges when we interact with the digital platforms in the system. So adoption is not going to be a challenge. The only challenge is proving a robust platform and the services. Thank you. Dr. Sindhu, would you like to comment on this topic? Anything you yeah, would like to add? Yeah, I'm basically a banker. So my uh, experience is from a banking perspective, 
not from a car perspective. And for me, uh, whatever I have been hearing till now, it is just two-way transaction that uh, uh, consumer and the service point. So that's the transaction level that we have been talking of. That is very good. There we can definitely secure the identities and we are much more comfortable in, in that area. But when we talk of banking transactions and when we talk of cross-border transactions and uh, money movement, that is entirely totally different world. And there it is fraught with all sorts of dangers because there are multiple layers of transactions and multiple layers of identities which have to transact with one another. So we have virtually, we are dealing with uh, uh, identity webs and identity like clusters beating against each other and we have to find the right way. Now, there are so many considerations are there like uh, country specific, location specific, how you are uh, retaining and uh, porting your data, how you are creating the data harbor, how you are creating the data hygiene, how you are maintaining all the agenda of FAT, the country, local regulations. So all those things create a totally different uh, scenario. And since the battle goes to cyberspace, which is again, a very, very dark world. So that's why we have to see how we are going to dominate that arena and create a niche for ourselves in that uh, sovereign status for our identities. And we can really control ourselves because once it is there in multi-transactional uh, uh, say uh, trans, uh, base, then you lose your control. Uh, you think that you are controlling it with hash or you are controlling it with your biometrics, but there are so many multiple biometrics which are uh, eating against your uh, uh, biometrics. And that is why I think there will be, uh, again, talk of uh, like multi-factor uh, authentication or uh, some like uh, in maths, we used to do uh, higher common uh, denominators and all that. So those type of things uh, are going to emerge because we are in a more complex digital world. Thank you. John, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this too. Would you like to weigh in? Sure, I'd be glad to. So really the perspective that I'm coming from is the e-commerce perspective. And so a few things that I think really the self-sovereign identity would solve for our perspective is, you know, when we're onboarding a new merchant into our ProPay platform, being able to have these verified credentials rather than having the merchant having to go through a very long process of being, you know, verified, KYC, AML, and uh, getting all their banking information, being able to have you know, a self-sovereign identity token to be able to do that would really reduce a lot of friction. And then also on our ProPay touchless system, you know, the whole concept beyond that was based on the pandemic. We wanted to be able to have you know, curbside delivery or touchless uh, delivery or touchless payments. So being able to have uh, self-sovereign identity from a consumer perspective would really reduce the friction there. And so rather than having to go through our messaging platform to be able to have a consumer process a payment to let's say a restaurant or any other type of food delivery that they could just use the biometric scan that you showed and the one you showed was a face ID. And I think that that would really reduce the friction and spur adoption of any type of uh, self-sovereign identity payment methodology. Great, thanks. I see a lot of questions coming in on two topics. So I think we need to address them. <laughs> I'm not gonna wait too long because uh, everybody seems to be concerned about data governance in terms of using uh, these type of uh, methods. Maybe you can uh, all comment and weigh in what kind of safeguards do we have so that people have trust in these methodologies and what can we do in the ecosystem to enhance portability, compatibility, interoperability. Um, maybe Prashant, we'll start with you with another fresh round on this. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Yeah, so let me just start by saying that, you know, we are a big, big supporter of standards in the ecosystem. Anything that we do in the payment ecosystem, that is all standard-based. Um, similar to digital identity, we are a big, big supporter of standards. And we feel that, you know, uh, user always owns their data. User controls it, they own it, they decide who they want to share it. Um, where I, or, or we at, at MasterCard, we struggle with is the governance layer in, in this ecosystem. 
user must own it, user must decide with who they want to share. There should not be any centralized repository of database. And if anybody reads our, uh, our white paper on our principles around digital identity, they are all very, very aligned. What we see as missing is the governance layer. Uh, creating an ecosystem, it takes time. Um, it, it takes somebody or, or maybe some like-minded companies or a consortium to be able to drive these standards. Um, these things will not, ex they will not um, uh, uh, exist without proper governing principles. You know, imagine in the payment ecosystem, you made a purchase, item did not show up. What, what do you do? You, there needs to be some rules, there needs to be certain scheme who manages these things. Um, or you buy certain product and um, uh, it was, the, the quality was not what you expected. You should have the capability to be able to return these things. So having these rules around payment is very critical. That's what made payment ecosystem very secure. And the same thing needs to apply to digital identity ecosystem as well. And these rules must, does not just apply to, to the entities who are participating, it must also apply to the users also. So what we feel is governance is critical. There has to be like-minded like -minded companies or consortium who needs to drive this ecosystem. We are definitely seeing you know, parts of these ecosystems evolving across the globe, but for this to really become a global interoperable ecosystem, there has to be a global standard and something that MasterCard is very, very happy to work with the partners. We are playing an important role. We are the founding members of Trust Over IP, but we feel those are the things that have to be in place for this to truly become a global interoperable ecosystem. Thank you. Ritesh, you also have experience across multiple continents. We wanna to touch a little bit on all these governance challenges we have, and also on the technical interoperability and portability that's so important. Both are equally important. Thank you, Ingrid. I couldn't agree more with Prashant what he has said about the governance and the security. Uh, the regulatory varies significantly in payments. Payments are, I would avoid to say that, but let me tell you, payment is a political business, right? And payment is a, a heart and soul of the businesses. So obviously when it comes to the payments, the one thing which is critical is the identity. And the other thing which is critical is and when it comes to the identity, another thing which is critical is around the data regulation, which we are having quite regularly nowadays. And we are seeing a significant transformation in the industry, in the payments, as well as in the banking and overall financial industry. We have seen that with the regulatory changes from open banking, and we are moving towards the open finance or in the future. But ultimately, even when we think about anything else, the data regulatory, plays a significant role in the payment innovation and the evolution and adoption of payment methodologies in the various regulatory or various regions. European market is pretty much mature in terms of the data, uh, data regulatory when it compares to Asian market, which is still catching up. Australia is setting up end of the milestone with the new regulatory, which is coming in shape now, which is the CDRs. US is still following up the footsteps so it varies significantly in terms of the regulatory. Yes, we need a global government governance body to take control of this and have, if we want interoperability around these payment systems, we need the leaders like the MasterCards and the Visa and the PayPal's of the world to come together and take the leading role in the governance along with the government regulatory bodies. It is not going to happen by individually by the payment companies or the governments or the fintechs, because ultimately you need a combination of that. And basically with the payments, we are fighting a lot many other challenges in the industry as well, financial inclusion for that matter. And identity is the key over there as well. So yes, we need a collaboration between these three pillars. Thank you. John, would you like to weigh in, given your professional uh, background? I think you have probably a lot of thoughts on this issue too, in terms of global governance. Oh, go global governance, I think, is definitely based on consortium, just as the two gentlemen talked about there. And realistically, you know, without Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, you know, participating in a consortium, and then also looking at the other players, you know, we're very familiar with working with PayPal and uh, Square as another primary uh, payment processor, getting those uh, groups together and then having it approved by the regulators is gonna be critical as well because even if an industry wants to build a consortium, 
without bringing in players that are from government, you're not going to get the regulatory approval and it's not going to come off as a global standard. So I think that's critical. And there are some communities that are taking the lead in really de decentralized identity. There's a project in British Columbia that's using blockchain to verify digital identity. And so maybe getting some of those thought leaders that are in government to partner with thought leaders like MasterCard would be a way to get that off the ground. Thank you. I wanted us to change topics a little bit and, and maybe talk uh, more about the impact of central bank digital currency implementations on adoption of digital identity for payments. Uh, maybe Dr. Sindo, you can start us off with that question and your thoughts. Yeah, on that's uh, one of my favorite topics <laughs> because uh, CBDC, the central bank digital currencies are very much akin to all cross-border transactions. and. Uh, that is the real, I should say, the uh, whole ethos of uh, this uh, financial system uh, uh, presently, because we are uh, rightly and en en uh, nowadays encountering all the protectionist measures. There is a, a very frantic race for uh, digital supremacy. Uh, as uh, earlier also I said that uh, deep space exploration and cyber uh, uh, dominance is a key word in uh, national, uh, uh, international politics and arena. So we can see how uh, uh, Chinese uh, government and US government, they are uh, creating a cyber uh, warfare because they need to control the uh, cyber area, which is the hotbed for all the data uh, Harboring all the data is resting there, so that is the basics of control. So CBDC is again trying to control the global economy. And when you see China is of course number one right now because uh, even US has, is yet to start on that uh, level, and China is already distributing uh, digital yuan to uh, certain people in Shenzhen area and trying to see how they are faring. So they are trying to uh, uh, implant that government-sponsored mercantilist philosophy and policies on uh, global uh, uh, say, uh, uh, theater. So that is what I will say that CBDC is nothing else. Again, it is uh, the, uh, uh, our own spirit, uh, how our country is looking at economy and what how we want to dominate it, that is being reflected in uh, CBDC. And that's why the payment system and cross-border CBDC will also move like that because politics is guiding the whole economy right now and since earlier times also. So that will be the basic agenda. Great, thank you. Prashant, do you want to comment on this as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me let me give it a try. It's, so I don't think this this concept of uh, central bank issuing digital currencies is, is new. But from a digital identity perspective, it's still very, very important to to make sure that, you know, the individuals are really who they say they are. Um, there is a strong um, uh, <clears throat> you know, requirement in the financial payment ecosystem, whether it's the EKYC, whether it's AML. You know, there is obligation on the financial institutions to make sure that, first of all, you know, somebody is not hacking just into my account and being able to just take the money or the money that is being transferred into my account. It is coming from the legitimate sources and the money that I'm actually spending is something that I really own. So I just feel that digital identity, uh, th there's a lot that needs to be done, but digital identity around KYC, AML, I think all those things will continue to stay as we continue to move towards uh, uh, digital currencies as well. Thank you. Ritesh, your thoughts uh, on central banks? I would definitely agree in terms of the CBDCs. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a payment is a political business, right? And nobody wants to lose that control. <clears throat> about the monetary policies within the, uh, within the regions or the countries, uh, because with the cryptos, Today, there's a huge difference between the CBDCs and the cryptos. Because of the cryptos, they, do, they lose the control on the monetary. Monetary policies lose control on the money. And that's why the CBDCs are very much required. And that's the future we are looking at. 
And there's adoption as well globally in the various shape and forms. The positive thing that I see from the CBDC is it's, it's fueling the adoption of the digital identity and the adoption of the technology by the various payment ecosystem, financial ecosystem, and the governments. And that is the positive thing. And obviously CBDCs are the future. That's what we are looking at. Now the challenge is like how <clears throat> that will be controlled because when you look into the current monetary policy, dollar plays the leading role. Who is going to play the leading role? That's where the challenge is. And that's why we need that governance around. But regardless, it is going to fuel adoption of the digital identity and the self sovereign digital identity, especially because in today's world, we do not own, yes, we say we own our identity, but we don't, right? In the open banking has given us that uh, right that we can consent and utilize the better services by the third party service providers. We are moving towards the open finance in the future where we are looking at all interconnected financial services. We would like to have access to all the services from our phones and everything interconnected. And what lies in the central is the identity. And we would like to have access and ownership of that identity. Great, thank you. Thank you. John. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, as far as the central bank digital currencies, you know, those are coming into their own over the next few years. We've all seen where PayPal now is having where you can purchase crypto within their platform. And so, you know, we can see these payment processing entities are gearing up for, you know, the use of central bank digital currencies coming up. And you know, I, I view the cryptocurrencies as almost the training wheels for getting ready for central bank digital currencies couple of things about, you know, the political side there. Yes, I think that, you know, move to a central bank digital currency is critical to really dealing with the international money supply. And we're probably all familiar with Bretton Woods, which kind of made the dollar the standard for international trade. But I think China would like to see that change. And, and that's why they're aggressive about the central bank digital currencies. But I think the other thing that we have to keep in mind as we move into this digital arena is really you know, is there anonymous payments going forward? Because, you know, with fiat paper currency, you know, there's anonymous transactions. But as we move in more to a digital arena, you know, what is everything going to be tracked? And I know we mentioned KYC and AML, but also, you know, it's, it's going to be recognition of what can be done anonymously versus what is going to be tracked back to the exact person. Thank you. I really appreciated all your insights. I would like to move now to one of our last big topics I was hoping to address for our audience, which is uh, biometrics. We've had a lot of questions coming in. So I think uh, same thing, maybe we'll start with um, with a round on, on each of your opinions. Debjani, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about biometrics and the challenges of onboarding consumers and the lack of trust or how to overcome their lack of trust. All right. Uh, so um, biometrics with SSI is an area which is quickly picking up and uh, especially only biometrics also that is an area which is very strong nowadays. Most payment providers and banks uh, as well as users themselves have started realizing that passwordless is the future. So uh, major banks and payment providers as I, as I already presented um, in the slides uh, you know, like uh, NatWest, Visa, MasterCard, they have started issuing biometric cards to users for payments that has limited possibility of a man in the middle attack because as i said um, now people mostly are uh, you know um, apprehensive to uh, you know work with biometrics like you know because that is something at the moment are mostly stored in centralized uh, data stores but with this biometric cards a new approach has been um, uh, you know, taken uh, all the data matching, the biometrics matching happens in the uh, card itself. Um, so, and also time has come when users should have the full provision to get um, authenticated to the banks and payment websites from their own devices and using the biometrics so that fraud can be controlled and minimized. Uh, hence, uh, time to invest heavily in good biometrics 
capabilities such as fingerprint, face, iris, uh, whatever we can do using our existing devices. And there is, I mean, no, no uh, requirement to go for additional investment uh, and we can do it with an with our existing smartphone. So this is an area which needs further investment in terms of research and good life nice detection test so that we can control the false positives. And this is a very hot area. I believe that you would see um, more products coming to the market in near future in this area. Thank you. We have questions coming in also about which, how do you know what the quality standards are in biometrics, which, which one is better and, and portability across uh, different markets and industries. Also uh, making sure that we, we are mindful about inclusion for those that might, might not be able to, to use biometrics such as the blind or deaf. Does anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah actually, I can. Comment actually, on I can... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, just... yeah. No. So this is this is a very very important area, critical, very critical area for us. I don't know if you remember the the user experience that I showed. Um, the solution that we are developing it is all based upon facial biometric. Um, you know, the example that Ritesh gave this morning, he wasn't able to trade because he forgot the password. I'm pretty sure everybody remembers the the story about the guy who had you know millions of dollars of blockchain forgot the password. So definitely having biometric, and if we don't have to remember password, it just solves for so many use cases. Um, you know, Johnny, you talked about uh, biometric card. So again, drives immense value, reduces fraud, re reduces friction in the ecosystem. I don't have to remember a pin, just makes life very, very convenient. Um, we talked about man in the middle attack or a replay attack. Where we are seeing certain challenges is uh, uh, yes, these technologies have improved a lot, especially facial biometric. Um, but where we are seeing certain challenges are the technology is not there yet to 100% say that this is a live person. You know, can there be replay attack? Can there be, um, I know this, this continues to evolve, um, but ha solving for that liveness detection is very critical in this particular area. We have to make sure that the individual who is interacting is a live person sitting behind the camera. They're not doing replay attack. They're not putting video. They're not putting photos. So that's one area that I would say is something that the industry continues to invest. And the second area is the standards. I think you, you mentioned in grid. Um, there are, you know, every solution that is we, we see in the market, they're using their own proprietary technologies, which is great um, because that reduces uh, the risk of fraud but then it just makes it challenging to just make it a globally interoperable ecosystem. My facial biometric that I've registered with one partner will only be accepted where at their acceptance network and vice versa. So I think if somehow we can come together, uh, come up with some standards which can make it a globally interoperable ecosystem that will add immense value to the ecosystem. Thank you. Debjani, you, want, you wanted to say something too and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. So like um, what Prashant just said, there are different kinds of biometrics and uh, so uh, not all are suitable for all use cases. Like, you know, um, face biometrics, yeah, it's pretty good, but it has got many false uh, positives. So similarly, <laughs> with iris at the moment, fingerprints, again, um, it has got its own issues. So we are just trying to think that what are the biometrics that we can use with our existing mobiles uh, or uh, devices or smartphones, like you know, palm pen is a very good biometrics, but then it needs additional sensors, additional kind of you know, uh, different kind of cameras. So the technology is new, and we cannot do it with our existing uh, smart devices, smartphones. So that is why uh, we have created a special video uh, with SSI and biometrics, different kind of biometrics, and the different use cases where they fit in. And that has been recently presented at Hyperledger Global Community. So Shiv is going to share that with all of you. So maybe that would be uh, helpful if you, you can have a look at that. Thank you. Ritesh, can you also share some of your thoughts on biometrics? I know you have some uh, interesting use case that you want to share on that. Sure. Those are, uh, um, there are a couple of companies. I don't want to name them over here again. Like we are not marketing anybody uh, and no favorites. <laughs> But there are uh, very interesting use cases, which I'm pretty sure we, most of us are aware of in UK and European market. Uh, it's related to the cards, so biometric cards, and which are going to be used for the CNP, like card not present. So that will reduce the false positive and false negative, as well as that will reduce the issues like the charge bags and the friendly frauds 
and the other sort of words. So uh, I can talk more about it in the future. Given the liberty, I can only discuss so much. But uh, when it comes to the biometrics, you know, here there's a huge disparity that we are looking at in the overall scenario. At one end, we are looking at the self sovereign identity as well as the digital identity. On the other hand, we have around, I wouldn't say the number of 1.7 because that was two, uh, 2017. We are talking about between 1.35 to 1.4 billion population. They do not have uh, access to the financial services, unbanked population, right? So the challenge is how we can make these systems and services available to common people. And again, the question comes down to the governance and the industry players like the MasterCard or the visas or the PayPal sort of world, how much they are doing and what they can do to make it possible for people to bring in into the mainstream of the finance. Because there are two different worlds altogether. Here, one hand, we are talking about the cryptocurrencies. People are dealing with that. On the other hand, we have got a one fourth of the population who do not have access to the basic financial services. And it is not down only to the developing countries or the underdeveloped countries. The challenge is everywhere. It's even in the developed countries too. You talk about UK, US has a major issue. So we need to think well beyond <clears throat> technology. We need to think more rationally for the society. Thank you. So it was long-winding answer, but uh, <laughs> my heart goes out to the people who do not have access to the finan basic financial services. John, any thoughts on biometrics? And maybe you want to comment also on B2B. We have a few questions that are trying to ask us if we have any opinions on the B2B component, not just on the person to business component. Yeah, as far as biometrics, I see that as, you know, being a great addition. And a lot of times, you know, we're talking about chargebacks and card not present transactions. Really, I see biometrics as kind of another layer where you can say, okay, let's reduce a little bit of the transaction cost because you have biometrics. So maybe not view it as a requirement, but maybe view it as an option. And it is a little bit better for the merchant as far as the processing cost. And then as far as B2B merchants, I do see blockchain smart contracts as really coming into their own between merchants. So a lot of the trade finance and supply chain agreements I see as being able to be settled using smart contracts and then being able to have the payment settle upon actions that occur on the blockchain network, not worry about you know invoices going back and forth and having to do processing of payments based on invoicing. Thank you. So maybe to we're getting close to the end of our panel. Maybe the one of the last rounds. I would love to hear what uh, what future trends you think uh, we're facing, and maybe your favorite one, if you can pick one. Um, Dr. Sindhu, maybe you can start us off with this last round. Yeah, uh, we are working with the farmers blockchain, and we have created that uh, uh, as a composite tool. Uh, for financial inclusion as well as uh, uh, occupational mobility in uh, tier four, five, six, whatever uh, tiers are there in any country. Now, when we are uh, uh, launching it and whatever app we have created, we are, we are using biometrics, but we are using multiple biometrics so that they can perform interoperable functions in multi-direction. So it is not only taking care of the identities, but with the uh, like uh, finger biometrics or thumb biometrics uh, scan, we are also taking care of their health, like uh, what is their pulse, what is their BP, like that. So uh, it is not only a tool for inclusion, uh, not only a tool for identity, but it is a composite tool for the whole personality of, an, uh, of a human being, that how we can uh, create multiple utility from one uh, perspective. Uh, that is biometrics. Uh, second thing, uh, I am, of course, more interested in the commercial aspect of uh, all these digital identities uh, because I'm basically a banker. So my focus always goes towards that. Uh, whatever we talk of uh, sovereign identities, we become weak and it becomes 
slave to the country's uh, nas- uh, international identity and country's philosophy. So we, our uh, subjugation is complete. We say and we think that it is sovereign identity, but it is not at all sovereign. And uh, that's how uh, even the uh, Bank of Canada, when they are trying to develop the uh, CBDCs, they are also talking of permission decentralization. So uh, in place of uh, absolute decentralization, which all crypto lovers want, uh, we are never going to have uh, that free run uh, because of all the compulsions of the government. So we will have a centralized decentralization atmosphere in which all the identities will work and they will remain subservient to the national identities. John, any thoughts on future trends? If you had to make your prediction of what you believe will be the trend we'll most likely face over the next year or two? Yeah, I think my prediction is really around the central bank digital currencies and even cryptocurrencies for e-commerce. We saw that uh, Dan Schulman and uh, PayPal moved aggressively into now offering PayPal purchasing of crypto within their platform. And I think once we get beyond, you know, the first iteration of the general public, and I think PayPal has around, you know, 20 million plus consumers getting accustomed to using cryptocurrencies and using central bank digital currencies, then I think that that's going to come into its own for e-commerce. Ritesh, prediction? Uh, Definitely adoption of the CBDCs and the cryptos uh, of the world in the markets. But at the same time, I would completely agree to what Dr. Sindra has said around uh, the centralized, decentralized digital identities. Though, because of, we can't self-attest our identities. Yes, we need ownership of our identities, but we can't <coughs> attest them. So we need our central bodies to attest those identities. For example, you uh, with the central identity or with the self-sovereign identities, you can't really identify the PAPs, the political exposed person, or you can't really do uh, the validations like the government identities. So yes, we, that's why we would need the centralized, decentralized identity. And that's the future we would be looking at. Prashant? Yeah, I, definitely the whole, even broader than the financial ecosystem, we feel that uh, healthcare is an area or that vertical, which can benefit a lot through this. You know, what we are currently seeing with COVID, with the vaccinations, the work that various, uh, you know, whether it's airlines or the governments are doing with uh, with your travel passports, they all have ban- benefits and, and uh, some cons as well. But I feel that the healthcare industry is something that is going to get huge benefit because of self-sovereign identity. That's how I got into digital identity, <laughs> my interest <laughs> stems from healthcare. So I, I had, awesome. if I had to give my prediction, it would be healthcare as well. <laughs> okay. Exactly. And that, exactly. <laughs> Devjani, your prediction? Yeah, um, of course, there there are two different areas that I predict would be highly impacted. One is um, IoT plus um, decentralized identity. So like uh, every every user would be having multiple devices in the future and those devices would be intelligent devices. They should have their own decentralized identity for, um, you know, safe data sharing. And so uh, IRT plus uh, decentralized identity is one area which is definitely going to pick up. The other one is uh, uh, privacy data laws. Like, you know, you must have heard about GDPR and, uh, and how companies got impacted, uh, how they were fined for not using their personal data uh, in the right way. So uh, similarly, uh, many countries in the world, they are coming up with their own data laws for uh, the personal data. Like in India, we got uh, PDPA, which should be coming and you know, it should be passed in the recent future. That is what my understanding is. Perhaps in 2021, similarly, Singapore has uh, PDPA um, and many of the many countries in, in US also, they have got different uh, consumer data laws. And um, we have to perhaps re-architect some of our systems to handle the personal data uh, with more care. So this is an area that would definitely be covered. Thank you. I, would, I will squeeze 
one prediction that I have, I think we might see digital twins emerge because you all highlighted the unique needs for different industries. So uh, for healthcare, we might see a digital health twin uh, that would help us protect uh, data. I know we even had a question about using DNA, right? And I think precision medicine will, will have a huge impact on digital identity as well. So my, my mini prediction would be that in the future, we might see also digital twins for finance, digital twins for healthcare, digital twins for other uses that, that we believe, such as education maybe, uh, where digital identity can also be used. But uh, thank you so much for all your insights. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it very much. We had a lot of activity in the, in the chat room. I wanted to also thank uh, Earth ID for uh, sponsoring this and GBA as well. Shiv, like always, you've put together an amazing panel. We want to thank you for your leadership and your support and your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And great. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of you joining. So I would like to thank individually. Uh, thank you, Ingrid, Prashant, Kitesh, Dr. Sindhu, John, Devjani. I think it was a very, very interesting conversation. And I think I really enjoyed it. And I think this is this is what we want uh, to share with our audience, right? Because, because we all are... Uh, working together to push uh, uh, the adoption of self sovereign identity. And that is where we need a lot of education and awareness around the world so that people can understand what this, what this concept and technology is about and how they can, how they can use this technology or even concept uh, to, to drive better uh, services and get, get uh, better services. Right. So I think this is, so we'll keep doing this every, every month. We have a we have an event which basically talks about decentralized identity across one one sector. Uh, so next one uh, next in line is basically okay yeah uh, for travel sector which we'll be doing uh, in February and I would like to invite every one of you to please join that event as well. We'll share our details uh, over different social media platforms and I think it would be great to have that conversation. Uh, as, a, as a closing note, because I think the Earth ID team has put a lot of effort and they had a message uh, which I wanted to share with every one of you. And it's a, it's a small uh, video which I want to play. I hope, let me know if you are able to see my screen and then yeah. I will see play that video. Okay. And yes. Okay. So on that note, I would like to, I think, thank you once again, and uh, we can we can close this uh, event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.